Good morning. Let us start today's class. Uh, one of you, please confirm that you can see what I'm writing. Yes, sir. Good. So uh, last time uh, we were leading up to the myhill narrow theorem and we defined some equivalence relations and a few terms. OK, so first of all, for any given language L, and L did not be regular. You can define this equivalence relation RL, which is defined uh, as follows. X is related to Y if and only if either both XZ and YZ belong to L or neither of them belong to L. Okay. So that's the first relation we defined. And we also defined for a given DFA, M we define the equivalence relation RM. By again, uh, this is uh, also on the same set. That is, it's an equivalent relation on sigma star. So it's extremely important to keep these things in mind. So let me put them in a box. So RM is defined by X is related to Y by RM. If and only if delta Q0 X equals delta Q0 Y. In other words, both X and Y, X and Y take uh, the machine M to the same state, starting from the initial state. So these are the two relations we'll need in, the, um, in stating the Michael Nero theorem. But we also uh, noted that uh, there is a one-to-one -one correspondence between the reachable states of M and the equivalence classes of R M because each reachable state uh, determines the equivalence class of all strings that take the machine from Q0 to that state. Okay. And the other way, for each equivalence class of R M, uh, there is a state in the machine uh, which all the strings in that class take you to from starting from Q0, right? So this uh, we had seen and further, we defined something called a right invariant We defined this property called a right invariant, where a right invariant equivalence relation. R on sigma star uh, has is this property x 
has this property x r y implies x z r y z for all z And we noted something happened here. Uh, I don't see that. Uh, still new to iPad. I, um, yeah. How do I remove this? There are two arrows which usually show how to expand this. Uh, seems to be even worse. Right. So that's an uh, that's a right invariant uh, equivalence relation. That's and it's easy to show that R M is uh, right invariant. Because delta Q zero X equals delta Q zero Y implies delta Q zero X Z equals delta Q zero Y Z, right? So that's why. Uh, RM is right invariant. And I said something wrong here, which I want to take back. I said uh, RL is not right invariant in general, but RL is also right invariant. And we'll show it in uh, while proving uh, the Myhilner or theorem, which we haven't come to yet, right? So this is proved later. This will be proved later, right? Uh, what else? Ah, we defined the index. Of an equivalence relation. This is just the number of the cardinality. Of the set of equivalence classes. So we talk about. Finite index an equivalence relation of finite index if the number of equivalence classes is finite. Or we talk about infinite index if the, the set of equivalence classes is not finite. Right? That we also define refinement. So we say that R1 uh, refines R2, where R1 uh, R2 are equivalence relations, 
if uh, x r one y implies x r two one. So every equivalence class of equivalence class of R1 is contained in an equivalence class of R2. So every equivalence class of R2 is actually a union of these joint equivalence classes of, well, equivalence classes are always disjoint, so I may not even mention that, of R1, right? So what can we say about the index of R1 and the index of R2, which has higher index or higher cardinality? If R1 defines R2, whose index is higher? By higher, I mean in greater or equal. R1. R1, right? In particular, if uh, R2 is, if R1 is a finite index, then so is R2. Because uh, the number of equivalence classes of R2 are fewer, either equal or fewer. Okay. So that's all the machinery we have. Uh, we need to state the myhill narrowed theorem and again you must commit to memory the statement of the theorem. And the theorem says it asserts the equivalence of three statements. The following three statements about any L, about any language L. are equivalent. Number one, L is regular. Which is the same as saying, it is accepted by some BFA. Number two, uh, this part is a little bit more involved, but uh, you pay attention to master of some of the equivalence classes. Of a right invariant equivalence relation. I just use uh, a shorthand map of find. So 
So there are uh, a lot of things uh, packed here. It's the union of some of the equivalence classes of right invariant equivalence relation of finites. Okay. Number three, <clears throat> the equivalence relation RL is of Finite so if you think about it, uh, you just look at one and three. The statement essentially says that L is regular if and only if RL is a finite index. Because all three statements are equivalent, right? So this is uh, much stronger than uh, what we have other characterizations, like the pumping lemma, in particular the pumping lemma, right? This characterization is if and only. So to show that a language is regular, uh, regular, just look at RL and whether the number of equivalence classes is finite or not. If the number of equivalence classes is finite, L is regular. If it is not finite, L is not regular. Okay. And this is one of the deepest theorems about uh, regular languages. Unfortunately, it is not there in the hopcroft uh, uh, motwani Alman book, but it was there in Hopcroft and Alman book. And I have, if you have noticed, I have uploaded those pages, right, in T. So you can uh, refer to those pages, okay? And you should go over this proof. Uh, if, if, if you don't completely follow everything in the class, uh, you should go over that proof yourself because it is really be a beautiful proof. Right, so the plan is, we are going to show As usual, whenever you have a number of a bunch of statements and you say that they're all equivalent, you usually go it, about it in this fashion. You show that one implies two, implies three, two implies three, and three implies one. So that shows that all of them are equivalent. So let's try one implies two. So we are given that L is regular, that is, it is accepted by some BFA M. Then L is the union of some of the equivalence classes of a right invariant equivalence relation of finite index, right? Now, can you guess which equivalence relation applies here in two? RM. It is RM, right? So we know that Rm uh, is right invariant. And it has finite index. Why? Because there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between the equivalence classes and the states. And by definition, it is a DFA, so it has a finite number of states, right? So also, L is just the union of the equivalence classes of X, okay, under RM, uh, such that delta Q zero X is an X. Okay. 
Okay. So just take the union of all those. This is just saying that the language accepted by M is the set of all strings which take the machine from Q0 to a final state, okay, right? Because remember the equivalence class of X under Rf is all those strings that take the machine to the same state as X does, okay, right? So any doubts? So, so we are done. So one implies two. Any doubts about this? You want me to go over any detail here? And recall that X R M Y if and only if delta Q zero X is the same as delta Q zero Y. Okay. So X and Y are in the same equivalence class if they take the machine to the same state starting from the final state. Any doubts about one implies two, so we have obtained L as the union of some of the equivalence classes, right? Not all. If we took the union of all the equivalence classes, then of course we'll get sigma star itself. Only those equivalence classes which correspond to final states. Yeah? Any doubts? So the states correspond to equivalence classes of strings. And we take the union of those equivalence classes which correspond to final states. Okay, I think it should be clear. Then we come to two implies three. So let us look at two. L is the union of some of the equivalence classes of a right invariant equivalence relation of finite index. That's two. Okay, and three says RL is a finite index. Okay. Well, uh, we show the following. We show that any equivalence relation E satisfying two is a refinement of RL. In particular, since RM satisfies two, uh, RM As we have seen, RM refines RM. So, uh, 
so uh, just look at the condition two, right? Uh, L is the union of some of the equivalence classes of a right invariant equivalence relation of finite index, right? So let E be such, such a relation, which means that it is, a, first of all, an equivalence relation, uh, and it is right invariant, and uh, it is a finite index, and L is the union of some of the equivalence classes of E. So it means all this, right? So how do we show that? Uh, uh, so once we show that the E is a refinement of RL, it follows that RL is a finite index because E itself is a finite index. And if it's uh, a refinement of RL, then it has more equivalence classes. So um, the implication for right. So that's what we need to show. Well, uh, we are going to show, right? So any equivalence relation satisfying two is a refinement of R. So assume that. So that's what we need to show that the E is a refinement of RL. So assume so let me write here. Hence uh, RL is of finite index, right? So we just need to show the refinement part. So assume X, E, Y. Right. And we got to show that X, R, L, Y. And here you need to remember the definition of R, L. Okay. Here it is, X, R, L, Y, if Either both XZ and YZ belong to L or neither belongs to L. That's X, R, L, Y. So keeping that in mind, uh, let's look at what happens if we consider XZ and YZ. Since E is right invariant, Uh, what we can definitely say is X, Z, E, Y, Z for all Z belonging to Sigma star. Okay. Here we are using the right invariant, prop uh, the right invariant property of E, remember? Two says L is the union of some of the equivalence classes of a right invariant equivalence relation of finite index, right? And this also implies since L is the union of of E, this implies, since XZ and YZ are in the same equivalence class, they either both belong to L or they don't belong to L. Why? Because L is the union of some of the equivalence classes, right? So when a set is the union of some of the equivalence classes of an, of an equivalence relation, then any two strings or any, any two elements which are related must be in that, must both be in that set or they are both outside that set, right? 
So this implies uh, XZ is in L if and only if YZ is in L. And this, if you recall the definition of RL, right? This means X R L Y. Any doubts? So uh, there are quite a few things that uh, you need to keep in mind. Uh, of course, the definition of RL, what right invariance means. Uh, uh, and once you have mastered those two concepts, then uh, this is not difficult. Any, any, any comments or doubts or questions? So we have shown we have shown that E is a refinement and of course uh, the the meaning of refinement uh, of r l. And hence, RL is of finite index. Yes? So two implies three. The proof is complete. Any doubts? If not, then let's proceed to three implies one. But before we do that, let's look at the statement of the theorem again. Okay, so three says RL is a finite index. And one says L is regular. That is, it is accepted by some DFA. Okay. So, uh, we'll of course proceed by assuming that RL is a finite index, but, and then come up with a DFA. But first we show that, uh, RL is right invariant because this will be used in the proof. It may take some time for you to master these notions because uh, it is easy to confuse the definition of RL with the notion of right invariant. So you need to go over the, these things again and again and uh, come back to the proof. Okay? And it is worth doing this because, as I said, this is one of the deepest theorems about regular languages. And it's a nice, uh, elegant proof, okay, which is not, you know, uh, pages and pages of uh, of uh, maths, but just a few lines, uh, just a single paragraph in each case, uh, and quite a short paragraph, okay. So we we first show that RL is right invariant. 
So what does right invariant mean? Uh, it means uh, that if X is uh, related to Y, then uh, XZ is related to YZ for all Z. Okay. So suppose X, R, L, Y. Uh, and uh, it, instead of Z, we just call it W, the string that we are going to append. Uh, so we have to show that X W is related to Y W, right? Which given the definition of W really means that X W Z belongs to uh, sorry, L. If and only if Y, W, Z belongs to L. Okay. Is this clear or not? Can anyone supply the next step? We can combine WZ as a string. Right. So take now take V equals uh, WZ, right? Uh, By definition of RL, by the definition of RL, remember what uh, the definition of RL is? The definition of RL is uh, X is uh, related to Y if for all Z, uh, either both XZ uh, and uh, y z belong to l or neither belongs to l so if we apply that to the string v either both x v and y v belong to L or neither belongs to L. But that is exactly what we wanted to show, right? Because V is, right? So RL is right in vain. Why did we show this? Because what we need to show is uh, three implies one, and three says RL is a finite index, and one says L is regular, that is, it is accepted by some DFA. 
So nowhere is it required to show that uh, RL is right invariant. So, but we need this uh, to complete the rest of the proof because what we are going to now uh, do now is to define a DF, DFA from RL, okay? We now define a DFA uh, let's call it uh, M sub L from RL as follows. Right? So what do you think should be the states of the DFA? I mean, you have an equivalence relation RL of finite index. Right, uh, sorry. Uh, all we know, yeah, RL is a, you have an equivalence relation, uh, I mean, defined in a particular way, which is a finite index. And you want to de define a DFA from there. So what do you think should be the states? Uh, reachable states from those equivalence classes. Well, just the equivalence classes, okay? Let QL be the finite set of equivalence classes of RL. Okay, we know that RL is a finite index. We are, we are given, that's the statement of three. So just uh, take the set of states to be the equivalence classes of RL. Okay, and uh, define delta L oh uh, we just uh, uh, Right, uh, but let, this is just a notation, let x within square brackets L be the element of element of QL containing the string x. Remember, every string will belong to some equivalence class, right? Why is that? Because, yeah. Why should every string belong to some equivalence class? Anyone? Because it is an equivalence relation, so like all of them will some either two will be related and they should form, like union of those should give the whole set because first of all it is reflexive so every every element is related right oh okay yes sir so for every x x r x uh, i mean x comma x belongs to the relation okay Right? So we just denote uh, the square brackets x by, by this notation. The element of 
SQL, that is the equivalence class which contains X, right? This is nothing new. I mean, we have been using this notation. So define delta L as follows. Delta L of the equivalence class of X, comma A, we simply define it to be the equivalence class of X A. But we need to show that this is well defined. Why, is, why do we need to show that? Because we are using a representative of the class to define what the image of the class should be, right? What if we took, uh, instead of x, we took, another, uh, we took another element y, which is in the same class, right? We should get the same, uh, we, we should get the same element. So we need to show We need to show that the definition is independent of the choice of X. i.e. Uh, if x and y belong to the same equivalence class, that is if x and y are related, then x a and y a are also related. We need to show this. Yes. But we have already shown this. When did we show it? Right invariance. Right, we have shown that RL is right invariant. So this follows, right? Uh, From the right uh, invariance of RL. I simply take Z equals A, right? So if X and Y are related, then XZ and YZ are also related. I just take uh, Z to be, right? So this is well defined. So we have defined the set of states, uh, the transition function, um, what is the initial state? U zero L. Every state in this automaton is some equivalent class okay so what is the initial state 
it should be the equivalence class of width string. Any guess? Epsilon? Yes. So just take the equivalence class of the empty string and make it the, uh, the initial state. And the, the set of final states. How do you define the set of final states? Well, take those equivalence classes. Such that X belongs to them. OK, then. The DFA. ML, the set of states is QL, which are just the equivalence classes of RL. Sigma, of course, is the alphabet. Delta L, we have just defined, right? Q0L and F. Maybe I should write L here, maybe the uniform. Accept L. Why? Well, Since Delta L Q zero X, right? By definition, what is it? This is Delta L Q zero is simply the uh, equivalence class of epsilon. Uh, right? By definition of Q0. And by definition of delta L, this is uh, epsilon concatenated with X. Right? Which is, of course, X. So, and thus, X belongs to the language accepted by LML if and only if this particular state is in FL, and if you look at the definition, it just says that X in L. Okay, so we are done. Any doubts? So we can define a DFA from the equivalence classes using uh, right invariance and all that, right? And the uh, uh, the definition is uh, quite intuitive. I mean, if you look at the transition function, it's quite simple. From the equivalence class containing X on reading at A, go to the equivalence class containing XA, right? And the initial state is 
the equivalence class containing epsilon. And the final states are the equivalence classes of strings in the language. Do you have any doubts about, um, not much time left, but maybe I can take a quick question. Do you have any doubts anywhere? Yeah? Well, uh, as I said, uh, not everything uh, may be clear when you first encounter the proof, so you need to go over it again and again, and I've uploaded those relevant pages from uh, Hopcroft and Ullman, so you should go over them, okay? And we'll meet tomorrow. Okay, let me stop here.